Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Kafke and I'm continuing the Master Databricks and Apache Spark series. This is lesson 36, Sparkly R, which is another package, an alternative to Spark R to allow you to use R on Apache Spark and therefore Databricks as well. This is an all code video, so no slides. I'm just going to go through and show you how this whole thing works. One thing I will point out is in this notebook, get a great reference to Sparkly R, which if I clicked on it, I don't want to leave my Databricks space, so I'm going to Go over here instead where it's already up and you'll see that it brings you to a really nice website where you get all kinds of documentation on Sparkly R in particular all the functions and they're broken up by category like operations for Spark, Spark data, Spark tables, extensions, all kinds of good stuff. There's a lot of functions here so obviously a lot more than I can cover in my video. Go take a look at it. It's great. It's riveting. And I'll put the same link in the description of the video so you can go directly to it if that's all you want to do. There's also a link here to a great book called the R in Spark.com. If you go to that, it's a nice introductory book all about Sparkly R. So take a look at it. I actually paid for it when it first came out, and now you can just get it free as an online book, but very worth the time. You learn a lot from it. And although it can't cover everything on Sparkly R, it gives you a really good starting point. You can also go to uh, spark.rstudio.com and get more information about Sparkly R because it's the people at RStudio that wrote Sparkly R. Now the first thing you're going to need to do before you can be up and running with Sparkly R is to bring in the Sparkly R library. You can see here it's as simple as just saying library Sparkly R. Now, if you're on open source Apache Spark, you're going to have to make sure you install in the cluster. But fortunately, Databricks does that automatically for us. However, we can't assume when we use R, this is an R notebook, as you can see, we can't assume it's going to use Sparkly R or Spark R because you have two alternatives. You don't have that in Python. So we need to tell it which library. So here we're going to bring in Sparkly R. We're also going to need a Spark context. What's a Spark context, Brian? Spark context is an object which allows us to connect to our Spark cluster. Databricks automatically creates a Spark cluster called SC for us when we run our cluster in a notebook. However, we need to replace it by using the function Spark underscore connect and then say method equal C and the parentheses and quotes Databricks. So replacing this with a Databricks connection specific to the way Sparkly R connects. So let's run this. You can see it attached to the Sparkly R package, but you can also see it says it's masking the filter function, meaning there's the same name in Sparkly R, a function called filter. There's also one in the stats package. Uh oh, what happens if I use it? What do I get, Brian? Well, what you'll end up getting, because Sparkly R was the last thing we installed, is you're going to get the Sparkly R version. Now, if you want to get the one in stats, you just have to prefix the function with the word stats, colon, colon, and then the word filter for that function name, and it will get it from the stats package. So it's not a big deal. But just be aware of that because you may get strange behavior you're not expecting. Let's take a look at the SC object we created, the Spark context. And when we do SC and just display it, we get a lot of information like properties, etc. So feel free to take a look at that. But it's just the way we're going to connect through some of our functions to use Sparkly R. One of the things we can also do is get configuration information. We use the Spark underscore config to do that. We return the results to CONF and then we're just going to print out the information we retrieved. We can see here there's all kinds of cool stuff just a few properties really. I want to call attention to be very watchful of this prefixing of our functions. Spark underscore something is one type of function and when you go over to your Sparkly R here you can see that it prefixes functions different ways. Machine learning starts with ML, data frame stuff starts typically with SDF, uh, data is Spark Hence what we're doing here for some of these functions. So just bear that in mind because it's a way that they organize these Sparkly R functions. One thing I've done a lot of talking about in my prior videos is this thing called the Apache Arrow package. Why do I talk about it? Because Apache Arrow allows your R programs on Spark to perform much, much faster, which is something we all want on a big data platform. Now, a problem is, though, Arrow is not automatically installed on your cluster, so you have to install it yourself. There's a couple ways you can do it, but the two primary ways I want to mention is one, you can install the package on the fly directly in your notebook, as I show here, comment it out. <laughs> but as I show you here, you can just say install the packages arrow. That's great. However, if you do that, 
bear in mind it takes a long time to install this package when I run it, it typically takes at least 20 minutes or so so that's a long wait and because I'm doing it in the notebook it doesn't make it a permanent configuration setting on the cluster meaning that by default the cluster will never have arrow unless I explicitly install it so as an alternative I'm gonna flip over to another page where I have my cluster open I can simply go in and libraries install new I already did this and I have arrow already installed here by doing that every time I start my cluster arrows installed what does arrow do anyway Brian what do I care basically what arrow does is it swaps out the way your data is stored in memory with a much more efficient column store format not only for the R storage but also for the Scala or Java virtual machine storage so that your R code and the JVM and Scala and Spark is actually storing the data the same way so your data frame does not need to be converted to the JVM format every time you move things between Sparkly R and the JVM or the Spark cluster nodes so that's a huge huge savings and massive performance improvement so you want to use arrow so I'm not going to install it through the notebook I'm just going to run library in parentheses arrow and when I did that you can see it says attaching arrow and the only thing it's masking is timestamp which is in the utils package we're going to use some files here and I'm not going to show you how to upload a file into Databricks but I did that already in a link in this notebook right here it brings you to video 10 I'll also post this in the description of the video so you can get it that way if you prefer video 10 not only gives you the data files but it will explain how to upload them and even create spark SQL tables from the data files. so it's a riveting video you'll want to watch that so let's step down now and assuming we've done that and we have a file called fact internet sales CSV which by defaults from that video installed in a folder called file store slash tables we can read that in using again these remember the conventions right spark underscore read CSV because it's a spark data function and it's going to create a spark data frame which we will return to SRDF underscore fact sales my naming convention is S stands for spark R because it's the R language and DF because it's a data frame then I'm just going to space it with an underscore so that I can say well what is this and it's fact sales so this is going to return fact to internet sales into the SRDF fact sales data frame. We haven't done anything with it yet, but it's now available for us. What if I want to see what it looks like, Brian? How would I see the schema for this Spark data frame? Good question. We can do that by using the SDF. That stands for Spark data frame, right? That's the naming convention for Sparkly R, Spark data frame schema. And we'll pass in our Spark data frame that we just created. And honestly, it's a bit verbose, kind of spaced out a lot, but you can see each column and then the data type. So it is kind of handy. Now you might ask, well, can I just use the good old R function, STR? Well, don't work too good with Spark data frames. You get a lot of properties, but nothing that's particularly easy to read and useful. So I recommend the other method. There is a thing called distributed Spark data frames, but there's also local data frames. When you're dealing with R, you can use both, and you really probably will be using both. The standard R data frame is the one you know and love. You've been using for years. It's fantastic, right? It's just an R data frame, but it has a limitation. R does not understand this fancy doohickey stuff about spreading things over a cluster and running in partitions. Instead, it only works on a single machine, which we call the driver node. So it's a limitation, but it has some advantages too. Because it is a R data frame, and not a Spark data frame, we can use all our favorite packages with it, including things like ggplot2 and on and on. So there are advantages to it. In the end, when we're going to do work anyway, we're going to have to bring the data back one way or another to the driver node so that we can look at it if we're doing like exploratory data analysis. So how do we do that? We use the collect function. That's actually a process built into Spark saying when you're done with stuff, bring it back to the driver node. It's a very common operation. But from Sparkly R, we prefix it with SDF underscore collect. So this is the Sparkly R function for doing that. That's going to return, hey, that's weird. Instead of SRDF, it says LRDF. Why? Because the L stands for local R data frame instead of a Spark data frame. And you want to know the difference because some functions work with local data frames and some work with Spark data frames, and you don't want to get them confused. So I use this naming convention. Notice I'm going to say STR on the local data frame. Will it work? Yes. It works great. Why? It's a standard R data frame. So we're good to go. Now, a nifty thing we can do, we're back on the Spark data frames, is we can create 
in my other videos you've seen this we can create spark sql tables which is almost like having relational database tables but not exactly but for our purpose we can use the sql language with them it's great we'll love it a nice feature of sparkly r is we can take our spark data frame and just save it as a spark sql table with a single function which is really handy the function is spark underscore write underscore table this is the name of the data frame we're going to write again it's a spark data frame our fact sales we're going to call the table fact sales so that's just it no uppercase or anything and if it's there we have this mode we're going to say override it that way if it's already there we don't get an error we just override it let's test if that worked did we actually get a new table well the table should be called fact sales so we'll just do a sql notice we use the sql magic not r this time sql select asterisk from fact sales and we'll just get two rows back just to see if we can really query this with sql and we can it looks great came right back awesome so it's kind of handy but brian what if i want to stay in the r language and still query it with sql you can do that let's take a look at that we use the sdf underscore sql function we pass in the spark context and then we just pass in our query just like before it's the exact same query only this time we didn't do a percent sql because we're in our r language right it, we're actually this is just a sparkly r function and look isn't that nice <laughs> so it looks good you may be wondering well can i do display on the return result from stf sql let's try it because display is kind of nice we can do visuals in databricks we can kind of take a look at the data coming back unfortunately we can run it but it won't display it so display doesn't seem to like sparkly r spark data frames or at least the return results here here's another nifty feature we want to query our table we created so this is a spark sql table right we want to query it well, if you've used R to connect to relational databases, you probably use a function DB get query. That's how you can pass it in. And typically you would have some sort of a connection string. In this case, it's a Spark cluster. Now here's the big takeaway. This returns a local R data frame. That took me a while to get used to because I would have expected it to bring, give me a Spark data frame. It don't. It's going to give you a local data frame. So I prefixed what's coming back to LRDF underscore sales info. I can prove it because I can use the good old fashioned our head statement to just get back a few rows let's try it that's about it so that's kind of cool it's nifty so if your goal is to run a spark sql query and you want to get back a local data frame then you can use db get query because it is also a local data frame i can use the sdr on it and there we are i can also use the summary function the built-in r summary function and i get all these nice metrics right about my local data frame now if i want to do something similar with a Spark data frame, I can use SDF underscore describe, and then I can just pass in my data frame. It's not exactly the same, but it does do some nice statistical things for us. For instance, we get a count, a mean, a standard deviation, a min, and a max. So not too bad. If you're wondering, what if I get lost? How do I know what the functions are? What's going on? We can always get help by using the help function and then just pass in the function name we need help with, and we get quite a bit of information. So that's kind of handy. That works with pretty much any functions in any of the libraries, so just be aware of that. Another way we can do it, we used that special SDF collect earlier, but we can just also just say collect and then pass in the name of the data frame, the Spark data frame we want. Then we can use display with it. And we get back results. We can go to our data here and we see the data. Another way to bring back data, as mentioned, you may want to sample. We can use SDF underscore sample, so we're not bringing back the entire data frame. Because if we were using a real-world scenario, this fact sales table could be a trillion rows, and it may just crash our cluster. We don't have enough memory on the driver node for that. So we can bring back a subset by using the sample method, SDF sample, and pass in the data frame name, the fraction, in this case 0.1 or 10%. We're going to say replacement is false. We're not even going to give it a seed. And we're going to pipe the results of that into display. So that should return a local data frame, which then gets displayed. And it did. And again, you can use the plotting options within the Databricks notebooks if you want to do more with that. If you want to get the names of the columns of a Spark data frame, you can just use the call names. And what if you wanted to use like dplyr, right? Because everyone loves dplyr. And we want to do some summarizing, right? We want to get some statistical information. So we're going to say summarize. We want to make sure we get the summarize function from dplyr. So just in case, we'll say dplyr colon colon. Pass in our Spark data frame. And then we want to say sum up the sales amount and remove NA values. 
then we also want to get a mean of sales amount we also want to get a standard deviation and a min and max now notice we say total sales equal this meaning that's what it'll return as a column name AVG sales equals the mean STD dev is the standard deviation and then we don't bother renaming these columns now it tells you because we brought in dplay off the first time it's telling you things that are going to be masked when it does that at the bottom we get our results and you can see we didn't rename these columns so it just gives you the function name just as we called it but these have been renamed let's take one more look at things it's one more EDA is right exploring data we want to take the data frame we want to pipe it through and just select a couple of columns we use select and then we select the territory key and sales mount we'll pipe that into a group by we're going to group it by the sales territory key then we want to summarize and we're going to summarize by getting the sum of the sales mount just as before but we don't want all those decimal places so we'll do a round function here round it two places then we're going to get the mean of the sales amount right and we're going to rename the first one total sales for the total sales amount that we're summing average sales will be the rounded mean we're doing here I'm going to pipe that into collect right because we want to return it to the driver so we can then pipe that into display and we get a nice little summary here we can sort etc we now have a total and average sales by the sales territory key pretty nifty so wrapping up that was a lot to cover but I think we covered a lot very quickly there's a lot more so take a look at the functions in the documentation link to that in the description as well Spark R is an alternative to Spark R and you still may be asking if you weren't paying attention what's Spark R the idea is you want to use R the R programming language on a Spark cluster meaning you want to be able to do distributed processing and Arrow which I mentioned you want to use Arrow in my last video I go to a lot of lengths talking about Arrow and the video before that I even go into just an it's all about Arrow basically talking about that you want to use that because otherwise you're not going to get very good performance in most cases but you got to make sure you install it and use it so watch those videos so I just want to thank you like share subscribe consider supporting me on patreon link in the description and until next time I'm Paul and fire we're all in this together thank you